here at Stanfield Baptist Church, across the way. Um, I love hanging out there. I love Jesus. I love teaching about Jesus. I love talking about Jesus. Um, two things about me you need to know. Number one, at some point I'm going to ask a question. I'm actually expecting an answer. I have lots of answers figured out, but Aaron said formal preaching, and my preaching is not formal. I tend to be, I try to be interactive. I love interacting. So um, if I ask a question, feel free to answer. Um, if I say something you don't, you don't get, feel free to flag me down. Number two, I tend to speak, speak quickly. I've slowed down a lot. I may still be a little fast, but I've slowed down a lot in my years. Um, so if I tend to run away, just flag me down, and I'll consciously try and slow down a bit, all right? So that's me. Today, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, so if you want to start turning there, and let's get some idea about Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet. He wrote in the late mid-700s to early 600s. So we're BC, right? So we're before Christ. So it's about 750 BC to about 680 BC um, is when Isaiah was, was prophet in Israel. Um, to put that context, you guys have been studying Ruth. Um, that's about 400 years after Ruth. And for those of you who aren't quite in the math thing, it's about 700 years before Jesus. Um, so just to get that, that's where he's at. Um, we're not going to talk a lot, a lot about Isaiah's message this morning. We're going to talk about Isaiah's call. First, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever experienced what they call the imposter syndrome? You walk into a situation and you're like, I am totally unprepared to be here. I was 18 years old. I was asked to be on summer staff, accepted as a summer staffer at Camp Tadmore. I was going to be a counselor. First day of training camp, it's great, have a great time. I'm learning a bunch and I meet some folks, have a great time. Right? And then Sunday comes. Sunday is the day that the campers arrive. Sunday morning, we get together, have a meal together, we pray together, and the counselors, I'm given a list of 10 campers that would be my responsibility for the next seven days. My thought literally was, will these children survive to Saturday? Because I don't think I'm prepared. I know these Bible studies, and I've worked in the Bible studies, and, and I, I've worked in Scripture. I know how to, to share my faith and how to lead kid to Christ. But I don't know how to get him from physically from Sunday afternoon to Saturday morning. I haven't got a clue. Are they going to survive? I was not prepared. Let me say that differently. I didn't think I was prepared. Isaiah here has some of the same stuff going on. So let's start. We're going to read the story. Isaiah chapter 6, we'll start in verse, verse 1. Read the story, and then we'll work through it kind of piece by piece, and I'll tell you some more stories along the way. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you we come together today and we can think about you. I pray that you help us think deeply. Help me to be clear in what you have shown me that I might um, translate or, or transmit your words through me this morning. Use me as your instrument. Help these folks uh, to really process and walk through this and, and as we think through this next few minutes um, that you will work really in their hearts and as you, you just go beyond this next few minutes. It can really be something that changes our lives better followers of Christ as we move forward. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you will do. And thank you for these folks. In Jesus' name, amen. So Isaiah, I've got a little short synopsis of this passage. Isaiah sees God and he understands God's holiness. 
then he recognizes his sinfulness and God cleanses him. And then he says, hey, I'm going to go. So he walks through piece by piece. God, he sees glory, right? He's invited into the throne room of God and he sees the glory of God. The, the image here is a king sitting on his throne. God's not physical being, you don't have to about that, right? But the image is a man, a king, sitting on a throne with his attendants around him. The seraphim are around him, and their job is to do whatever the king wants. When the king says go, they go. If the king doesn't say go, they stand and wait. Their job is to be there just to attend to the king's wants. Earthly king, they'd be attend to his needs and that kind of stuff. He needs food, whatever, but God doesn't need that. So they're there to attend to God's holiness, to God's, just do it, right? We see a similar story in Revelation chapter 4. We're not going to go there, but you can go there if you like. Jump in there. Revelation 4, we see John, the apostle John, who writes Revelation, gets set in, walked into the throne room, and it's just a beautiful picture. And there's some similar verbiage, right? Um, here we read as... They're talking back and forth. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. If you get to Revelation, it's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. We sang a song this morning, holy, holy, holy. I think of more songs, right? This verbiage is familiar to us if you're part of church or if you read your Bible a bunch. But actually, it's very unusual. So let me tell you what holy, holy, holy they're trying to get to. Okay, so English lesson. Here you go, Seth. We'll get you there. English lesson. There's a thing called a superlative, right? Superlative. It is better than. Right? So I would say that chicken fried steak and eggs is the best breakfast ever created. You laugh, but I'm right. Um, anyway, but that'd be, that'd be great, right? But actually what I would say is chicken fried steak is the very best breakfast ever created. Maybe the very best meal ever created. I don't know. I have to have a conversation about that. But if I was speaking in the Hebrew verbiage, I would say chicken fried steak and eggs is the best, best meal created. Because when you stack the best, it's saying it's, it's better than better, right? It's the very best. We see this uh, in the temple when they're building the temple. The, the inner sanctum is the holy of holies or the most holy place. I'm citing my Hebrew in this one, but I'm guessing those two words are exactly the same. The, the word play there it says holy of holies or the most holy place. It's the same set of words in the Hebrew. I'll have to look at that at some point. I thought about this morning in the shower. It's like, I don't know if that's true or not. So there you go. So that's right. So we're stacking the better. Uh, I read a commentary this week, and he says it far better than I can, so I'll just read it to you. But here for the only time in the Hebrew Bible, the quality is raised to the power of three. As if to say the divine holiness is so far beyond anything the human mind can grasp that a super superlative has to be invented to express it. Furthermore, that the transcendence holiness is the total truth about God. He is so far, so high, so great above us that just saying he's... Holy, holy is not enough. He is holy, holy, holy. His holiness is therefore unapproachable and unique moral majesty before which sinful humankind instinctively quakes. As we read in the passage, we actually see that the earth quakes. Right? The foundation in verse 4, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. The foundations of the threshold shook. Ancient building practice nowadays, the, the, the foundation is, let's plant it just as close to the bedrock as possible, right? The earth shook because the seraphim were claiming, you are holy, God. And the earth's like, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm going to shake. I'm gonna, Whoa! So holy. Isaiah recognizes this holiness. He understands God is way over me. And what's Isaiah's response? Read in verse 5. And he said, Woe is me, for I am 
Uh, sorry, woe is me, for I am lost, or I am ruined in some translations. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. I am cursed. We don't use woe language anymore. This is not something we use in our common language. Woe, I'm calling a curse upon myself. I deserve to be dead. Why? Because I'm in the presence of God. We read a story in Exodus chapter 33. It's a story of Moses, kind of the end of Exodus there. Moses is hanging out with God, having great conversation. How would you like to do that? It's a conversation with God. And Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says, nah. He says, you can't see me. You can't see my face and live. In fact, he says this, and I quote uh, Exodus 33, 20. Um, God said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. This theme is carried throughout Hebrew poetry and Hebrew Bible. In the book of Judges, we see a couple of times Gideon once and someone else who like name I've lost. Um, they both see God, they're actually a, a messenger of God, and the response is, I deserve to be dead. God's response is always, fear not, because <coughs> I'm here. I'll take care of you. But to be in the presence of God Response is, I deserve to be dead. Because what they're saying, what Isaiah is saying here is, is, God, you are so high and so far above me that when I look at you, all I see is my inadequacy. All I see is that I am just a little bitty, terrible, terrible, man, not the right word. I, I'm inadequate. I, I have no, nothing to give you. Now, we often see God... Um, in some of these ways, we, we understand our inadequacy, and we deal with it. People in the world deal with these things different ways, right? So I don't know how many of you guys are church folks. I don't know your history at all. I know some of you. That's not true. I, know, I don't know you three. I know the rest of these guys, <laughs> kind of, sort of. Um, anyway, people come to church, and, and people hear the truth of God, understand at some point the holiness of God. Is that my time? I'm done already? <laughs> uh, they understand the holiness of God. And the response, I see several responses. Number one, we get this response of runaway. That's kind of Isaiah's response here. I, I need to be out of here. I cannot function in this place because, oh no, right? Run away. I'm way too holy. I'm way too sinful. I'm way too broken to be here. That's one response. Another response is to work harder. This is where the Jews kind of land. This is where a lot of church folk land. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to try harder. I can do my best to follow the laws. I'm going to be a morally awesome dude. I'm going to do great and be better than whoever. I'm going to work hard so I can be better, so I can be acceptable. And I'll tell you, this doesn't work. Um, C.S. Lewis, I've been reading a book called um, Mere Christianity, an old classic work of C.S. Lewis. Great book, by the way. Um, there's a chapter kind of toward the end where he's talking about, um, well, I call it fake it till you make it. Um, but the idea here is that that we are not able to be morally good. We just can't do it. But if I continue to try to be morally good, eventually I will be more good. And the beautiful line in this book, the beautiful line, I'm in the chapter, next chapter, but anyway, the beautiful line is, is God creates us or looks at us as we are holy, and Jesus stands next to us to make us that way. It's not my effort that makes me holy. It's not my effort that makes me better than I was before. It is God working in me through Christ. Now, Isaiah obviously is, is before Christ, right? But Isaiah sees God, understands the holiness of God, and his response is, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. He confesses his sin. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. That's Isaiah's response to understanding the holiness of God. You got some Awana folk in here? Yeah, 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah confessed his sin. First he said, shoot, I, I don't, oh, I'm toast. I'm terrible. I can't be here. But then he said, because I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips. The people I represent are a people of unclean lips. 
We don't speak right. We don't think right. We don't do right. If you know the history of Israel, it's a bloody, awful, terrible history. Um, but it's a beautiful picture of God coming in when he, the people don't deserve it. Just, just read the first five books of the Bible. Go to Judges if you want some nasty craziness. Go to Judges. You see the terrible, awful. I mean, the depravity is amazing. Go to Chronicles with Kings. You walk through the Kings times, and it's just, it's astounding. Anyway, it's a little off my notes, but that's okay. The idea here, so God comes and cleanses. So, so Isaiah understands God's holiness. He recognizes his sinfulness, and he confesses. And God responds. This is verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the taught with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sins atoned for. What's the seraphim's job? What's that? Do what God asks, right? I'm attending to God. So is this the seraphim saying, hey, I got a great idea. Let's grab this thing and let's take it down and touch Isaiah. Is that what's going on? No. God says, hey, you, take that coal and go touch Isaiah's lips and cleanse him. God is initiating the cleansing. God says, I see you. I love you. I'm going to cleanse you. And this word atonement, your sins have been atoned for. Have any of you used that word in a sentence lately? I haven't. That's not true. I've used it a lot because I've been reading this. Um, and actually, so youth group, last couple of weeks, we've been talking through the Bible, and we talked through Le the book of Leviticus, which is where the idea of atonement comes from. So what happens in the book of Leviticus? Let's walk through the story, right? So the story of the Bible, from the beginning, you get creation, blah, blah, blah. Abraham, Abraham's family ends up in Egypt, right? The Egyptians decide there are too many of them and they're not cool, so we're going to oppress them. We're going to beat up on them and make them slaves. They cry out to God. God says, okay, I'm going to save you. Moses comes in, takes them out, right? Exodus, they walk through the desert. Um, they start kind of okay, but within just a very little bit of time, they're rebelling. They're saying, ah, oh, God, you're stupid. Let's go back to Egypt. Over and over and over again, they get this, this, I'd say, beautiful story, but it's kind of a terrible, awful story. But they're not too bright. Well, anyway, <laughs> you're right. Um, so they get in this, in this situation, right? And so at the beginning of, or the end of Exodus, we read the story, God, Moses and God are talking. Um, Moses literally says to God, if you're not with us, I don't want to go. I want you with us. And God says, I want to dwell among my people. But there's a problem. To dwell with God, you must be holy. For God to dwell among his people, the people must be holy. The beginning of number, the beginning of Leviticus, Leviticus, I think, verse 2, and uh, yeah, 1 1 even, 2, somewhere in there, first couple of verses of Leviticus. Um, God and Moses are talking. God is inside the tent of meeting, and Moses is outside the tent of meeting because Moses can't be in the presence of God. Book of Numbers is next. God and Moses are in the tent of meeting, having a conversation. In between that is Leviticus. A bunch of ritual laws talk about how we can be spiritually, how we, uh, ceremonially clean. There's the big word. How we can be ceremonially clean. It doesn't truly clean us. And that's really the conversation we're going to land here for a few minutes. But God made a way for them to walk through this process of sacrifice and the centerpiece of the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16, go read it. It's pretty cool. We could spend probably a couple, three, four weeks really talking about the beauty of this passage, this, this middle of this atonement, what it really means. But the heart of it is God says, the high priest, you can come visit with me and you're going minister, to minister to me. Sounds, well, it's true, but um, you're come and minister in my presence. You're coming to my presence, into the Holy of Holies. Only time you can do that. Come in and minister to God and you're, you're sacrificing, you're coming in and making atonement. You're making um, payment for the sins of the people. He's got to make sure he's clean first. Then he goes in and makes atonement for the people. Then he comes out and you sacrifice his goat for a sin offering and the other goat you let go, the scapegoat. Let's we get that term, by the way. And this goat cruises off. 
But before he does that, he confesses his sins over this goat, the sins of the people, and then that goat gets away. The goat, the sins have been carried away out of town, out of, out of, now the people are holy. It's much more complicated than that. It's much more nuanced and beautiful than that. If you really want to get into it, it's an awesome sight. But the point is God has said, I'm going to take away your sin. Now back to the Awana people. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 3, 23. For some have sinned, a few, most, all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Humans, are we all human here? I'm not sure about teenagers, but the rest of us, yeah? We're humans. We have sinned. I have sinned. I deserve death. Right? Human sin is a human problem. It's not a problem the animals have. Animals function the way they're designed to function. A lion goes and hunts and kills a gazelle and eats that gazelle and enjoys, I don't know, do they enjoy the meat? I don't know. They eat it. For I don't think they do enjoy it. I'm thinking about it. They eat it because, well, that's how I survive. Right? Humans have this beautiful idea of, of making choices. We're going to have chicken fried steak. We're going to have some lesser food. <laughs> we choose to eat food because it tastes good. And sometimes our bellies say, it tastes good, but it's not really good for me. Right? And that's why you get like me and you're a little overweight. But that's okay. We have choices. We make choices all the time. And most are not morally significant. What I'm going to eat for lunch is not a terribly morally significant question. But do I follow God's law and do his, what he wants? Or do I follow my desire and do what I want? That's morally significant. And the Bible is really clear that we are held responsible for our morally significant choices. So sin is a human problem. So if I sin, who deserves to die? I do. Right? If I sin once, I deserve to die. Now, am I more valuable than a goat? I sure hope so. Am I more valuable than a bull? I'm more valuable than a bunch of bulls, a bunch of goats. And the fact is, I've sinned more than once. Yesterday. <laughs> we sin all the time. Sometimes we recognize it, sometimes we don't recognize it. That's part of the whole idea, right? Sometimes we, we understand we sin and sometimes we don't and the sin gets brought to light somewhere down the road. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 10, one of those two. I'll get there in a second. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, that's where it's at. I could look at my notes, it'd be helpful. Hebrews chapter 10. Do, 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 do. It's elevated music while I'm turning pages. And it's Baptist air condition. Throw back and forth. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm starting in verse 1. For since the law is but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices continually offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. If I follow the law perfectly, I cannot be made perfect. Even if I do it right. And I can't do it right. Even if I do it right, I cannot be made perfect. Verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, had no longer any consciousness of their sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It is simply not possible for my sins to be paid for by the blood of a goat. Can't happen. So how does this work? Because God can't live in the, in the midst of people that aren't holy, but he lives in the midst of the Israelites. How does this work? It's not the sacrifice, does it? I would offer to you this idea that when 
God sets up the system, and the Israelites are faithful and trust God that the system will work. It's the trust in God that it works. It's not the sacrifice. I'm going to trust you, God, that this system that seems ridiculous will actually be efficacious. There's no big word for you. Effective for my salvation. Now, we have this beauty, beautiful point, right? We're at the other end of the spectrum, right? They're pre-Christ. It's at Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. If you go back to Leviticus, you're talking like a 1,000 years before Jesus. More than that, even, right? We are on the other eye, right? 2,000 years past Jesus. We see the whole picture. What's been happening? When he makes this, when God makes this, this covenant with Israel, if you do these things, I will forgive your sin. I'll make you clean. He's just taking all that stuff slide it forward to the cross. And the true sacrifice, right, Hebrews, is, is a, a vision. It is a, a, a type of what's going to happen. It's not the true thing. The true thing is Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the one only thing that can help us. The only thing that make us truly clean is Jesus' death on the cross. So all these sacrifices are saying, okay, I understand. And there's beauty in this. I'm, I don't have time. Um, <laughs> I call myself a Bible nerd for a reason. I love this stuff. Uh, there's a beauty in the system. I'll be short. <laughs> that, that the system, everything, every part of the system, the Day of Atonement, the Passover, every part of this system that you read about in Leviticus and again in Deuteronomy, every part of the system points to the cross points to this better Savior down the road somewhere. They don't know it. They can't see it yet. There's a promise way back in Genesis that I'm going to bring up a better Savior. This promise comes back over and over and over again through the Old Testament, through the, the stories of Moses, through the stories of Joshua and Judges and Kings and the prophets. Over and over and over again, there's going to be a Savior coming. Trust. Trust. Trust that God will do what he's planned to do. So how do sacrifices work? Well, they don't. Except for that one sacrifice. How does it work? I trust in God. That he said he will do. And he does. So, what do we got here? Isaiah sees God and he understands his holiness recognizes his own sinfulness, responds, woe is me. God responds to his confession and says, you are clean. I have made you clean. And Isaiah is now ushered closer. Remember the front end, we see this thing? Isaiah hears the seraphim calling back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. He doesn't hear God talking. The seraphim are talking back and forth. And he walks in, but now, in verse 8, And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for me? Heard the voice of the Lord. Isaiah has been made clean. He has been cleansed. So now he can not only see God, see God's glory, he can be in the presence of God's glory. And now he hears God speaking, internal dialogue. I Guarantee you, God knew who he was going to send. That wasn't the issue. But he has seen God's glory, and now he hears God's call. And his response is no longer, fall flat on my face, I deserve to die. Now his response is, hey God, this guy, this guy, I want to go. I want to go tell the people. A little more history for you. In the time of Isaiah, it's a terrible time. We've gone through the period of judges. Every man does his own thing, and there is no God. They just do what they want to do. A God to themselves, I think you could say. We've gone through a good chunk of the period of the kings, where some good kings to do good stuff, and a lot of really sucky kings to do terrible, awful things. Lead the people astray. The Assyrian Empire is, is on the rise. And before long, in fact, before Isaiah is done prophesying, Israel will be hauled off into captivity. 
this is a terrible, awful, scary time in history. And Isaiah says, I want to go. I want to tell the people of Israel, I want to tell the people of the world, God, how great and awesome and wonderful you are. Please, send me. I'm not sure Isaiah is excited about that when you start reading the rest of his prophecy, but let's not go there because he had a hard place to get talking. So, God cleansed Isaiah. Isaiah says, send me. Has God cleansed you? Because Jesus died on the cross that we might be clean. Right? I don't know where you're at with God. I know some of you. Um, but I can tell you, God died for your sin. And he asked you to go. Um, where am I going? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm starting in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in new Christ, sorry, da -da -da -da, back up a little bit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Anyone is in Christ, he is no longer the sinful, awful mess of a person. He is a new creation. He is one with Christ. God sees you as Christ, holy, redeemed, sanctified. He is a new Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God reconciles us, and he gives us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Does God need us to make his appeal? Does God need us to save people? Does God need us to tend his world? Back to Genesis. God made a perfect garden, right? We tell Adam and Eve, tend to the garden. Did God need Adam and Eve to tend the garden? No. Not at all. God's perfect, created a perfect garden. What tending is there a garden that's perfect anyway? Anyway, I'm not a gardener, I don't know. God, what do you think, Sarah? Is there something? A perfect garden? Is there some tending to do? I don't know. There's no, there's no rot, there's no bugs, there's no, there's nothing. You get fruit and you pick the fruit, I guess. Tend the garden. God gave Adam and Eve an idea of, you're going to co-labor with me. You'll be part of my program in order to, to, to bring my glory to the world. 2 Corinthians. Does God need us to save people? Does he need us to get his message out? No, we got the stars. Drive in this beautiful snow and, and just, it's awesome, right? God speaks all the time through his creation. He doesn't need us, but he wants us to be a part of his creation. He doesn't need you. He wants you. How much better is that? If I want you and I need you, I need my wife because I can't cook. I really can't. Mac and cheese only goes for so far. I need my wife. And I want my wife. But imagine how much better it would be if we don't need anything. God doesn't need us for anything. But he wants us anyway. Is that beautiful? Is that just like, I understand. Okay. Uh, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are making, he is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. And when we understand that, when we get to the point, we understand, I am fully imaging God's righteousness. I think our only hope, our only option is to say, here am I, God, send me. 
I want to go. I want to be the man through whom you speak to these people. There's no greater joy. There's no greater joy than seeing someone finding Christ. Someone understanding Christ for the first time. My life theme, my life motto, whatever I want to call it, um, uh, help people take their next step in their Christian walk. Is it that first step? Have you never heard of Jesus? I want to be there to introduce you. I've been walking with Jesus for 40 years. I want to be there to help you take one more step. I've been walking with Jesus for, I think, 47-ish years. I've been urgently chasing after him for the last 35. I just, I love him. I want to see him more. I want to see him move. I want to let God use me because that's what God wants to do. He doesn't need me, but he wants to use me anyway. We, I have seen the glory of God. Where do you see the biggest part of God's glory? We see it on the cross. God, glory. I've seen the glory of God. Interestingly, a little side note, high and lifted up. The king is lifted up, Isaiah. John, Jesus is lifted up. He's exalted on the cross. I have seen the Father. I've seen the glory of God in Jesus. And we get to respond. Are we respond in fear? Are we going to respond in joy? Here am I, send me. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your message and your, and your, your work. Thank you that you choose us to use us, to work through us, that we might really make your name known well. That the world might see your glory through us as a body of believers, as individual believers, that we might truly show you well. Thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.